delighted to have so many of the pastors from Mumbai area to have come with their families to honor us and accepting our invitation to come here to attend one of our annual events which is called the Pastors Appreciation Banquet. And this we are doing uh, to honor all the pastors about which our speaker will explain why, what is the need and why we delight in the presence of you. I would like to say I am what I am today because my pastor nurtured me, lifted me up and made me what I am today based on the word of God. Many of the Gideons here would like to thank you. We welcome you pastors for having accepted our invitation and come to this gathering. I also would like to take this opportunity to honor some of our Gideons who have done leadership service in this ministry. As I call the name of the people, would you please stand up who have held the positions and led the nation to where we are today. Dr. James Thomas, would you please stand up? He was the past president, past international trustee, and he continues to serve the Lord in the position. Thank you. Please stand, James, as I invite Sister Marina Thomas, who served this ministry as the auxiliary national president for a full term. And she continues to do the work of the Lord in the city of Navin Mumbai. Please be seated. I would call now Brother Raja B. Singh and Sister Shanta Singh to stand up, please. Brother Raja B. Singh has been our past national president and uh, he was also, till recently, our international trustee. And they live in Mumbai and they have served the Lord much more effectively. Honestly to tell you, I am a Gideon recruited by him in this city of Mumbai. Praise the Lord. I would like to call upon Brother M. V. Abraham. I feel I should not ask you to stand up, but I would like people to see you, Uncle Abraham. He is the <laughs> past president, and also he is the only member who has attended more than 36 Gideon Convention so far. I would now call upon Mrs. and Mistress Matthews and Slochna Matthews to stand up, please. Mr. Matthew lives in Visakhapatnam and he was the past president and sister also was the auxiliary vice president. You were State Auxiliary State, I'm sorry. Auxiliary State President for uh, Southeastern State. Give them a clap of hands to glorify God for what they have done. It gives me indeed a great pleasure that the largest ever convention we have in Mumbai, in spite of all the difficulties, you people took time to come. God bless you all as we proceed further I would call upon Professor Sam John, our National Vice President, to read the Word of God. Before we go to the program proper, uh, I would request all the pastors and their wives to stand up so that Gideons can welcome you with an applause, thunderous applause, glorifying God for your services. Will the pastors and their spouses and the family members may please stand up. Gideons, come on. Louder. Thank you, pastors, and please be seated. I would now call upon 
Ms. Luan Triplett, International Auxiliary Vice President, to come forward and give us her highlights on the Auxiliary Ministry. Leanne Young started nurses training as a rebellious, headstrong teenager. She was willing to stand up and fight for any cause that she believed in. Well, because of this leadership quality, she was elected president of her nursing class and was invited to attend the first student nurse convention. There she received a copy of God's Word. It was a medical testament from the Gideons. But she went back to her room and she placed the medical testament in the drawer with her other souvenirs. Months went by and Leanne became more bold and more rebellious. She was so deeply in trouble. Her grades had dropped, her attitude was very bad, and she eventually was going to be expelled from the nurse, School of Nursing. The administration decided to give her one more chance. Well, you know, Leanne went to her room. She pulled out the medical testament. She opened it to the back, and in the back, she started reading. It first told her, God loves you, from John 3, 16. Then she read how all are sinners, from Romans 3, 23. But then in Romans 6, 23, she read about God's remedy for sin. Until then, she didn't know or understand that all may be saved now, Romans 10, 13. Leanne knelt down beside her bed, and she asked Jesus to come into her life. And praise God, he did. She now serves at a local nursing home where she uses this medical testament to win others to the Lord. As the wives of Gideon's nurse conventions are just one area of distribution for the auxiliary. We also distribute to jails and prisons. We place Bibles in dentists and physicians offices and those in the medical field. You know, hospital nurses have shared with us that many times they're the last person their patients see before going into the presence of the Lord. They can read them the scriptures, though, on the back page of that testament, and they can give that patient the opportunity to have assurance of eternal life. You know, when inmates were asked by the chaplain of a women's prison, why are you grateful for the testament you've been given? Here are some of the replies. You can read it and hold it next to your heart while you're away from your babies and husband. It teaches me to live my life and how to let God help me. Another said, the Bible is transforming my heart, my soul, my mind. Thank you, another one said, it has helped me through some of my hardest times doing time. You know, as auxiliary members, we not only place God's word, but we pray regularly. We pray for the ministry. We pray for the scriptures that are given all over the world. And we pray for you, pastors. We're encouraged to have a personal prayer time, as well as to meet regular for prayer meetings. We're also encouraged to purchase personal workers' testaments that we can use with a personal witness as the Lord gives us opportunity. Last year, the auxiliary placed almost 4 million testaments around the world, and over 400,000 of those were placed here in India. We want to say thank you, pastors and special guests, for your support that makes it possible for the Gideons to give God's word that brings peace and salvation to those that are hurting. You know, giving God's word is one of my favorite parts of the ministry because of his promise to us in Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall prosper, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I will call upon Brother Anand Pillai, Senior Vice President of HCL Technologies, to come and give his testimony. Firstly, I want to tell you that 
had it not been for the word of god i would not have been where i am but it all started many many years ago more than 35 years ago you know that was the time when i was going through a dilemma there was this confused situation at home where i was just about what working with my father at home and my father because of a property dispute in the family got into a kind of a confusion or a conflict with his own brothers where they cast an evil spirit onto him and most of the fa- family members did not understand his behavior because he would throw the food onto the floor saying that you are not giving me food you are giving me worms to eat he threw the milk and he said this is blood to his eyes that was what appeared the educated members of the family said he is mentally disturbed the religious members of the family said god is tormenting him and in the months and the days that followed there was a lot of confusion nobody could find a solution to what was happening he would run out into the street and fall in front of a running vehicle because that is what the spirit ordered him none of us understood in fact i myself did not understand what was going on until one night when he was locked in the room because of the kind of confusion that was happening all alone he was locked in the room in the morning when we opened the door we saw a scratch like that of our nails right across his back now you'll know that our posture we cannot get that on our own body this was when i realized that there is something powerful that is at work and of course he himself realized that when he was possessed by the evil spirit he would get very tormented he would come to our school and pull us out of the class because he thinks or he thought that we will also be affected but to cut the long story short one day as we were at home you know we sold one home because that was what was possessed we went to moved into another place and that was where all by himself when we were outside playing and my mother had gone to the market i came home when, to drink water and i found him hanging right in the ce- ceiling the evil spirit had tormented him enough i did not understand i was only 10 years old i got up and cut the rope and as the body fell there was a lot of others who came in and they tried to see what had happened my mother uh, later in the day came from the market i got confused why did this person whom i loved most and who loved me leave me but the things that happened the years that followed this happened in 1970 the years that followed two years every two years there was a death in the family another two years after that three years actually my sister who got married there was a confusion again not confusion there was a conflict because in a hindu system we have this dowry a lot of gold and uh, jewels and money was given but one year after that more money was demanded when my mother went to call her for the pongal festival and she said listen why should i be an item that is traded in fact there was one statement that my brother in law mentioned he said you can take your daughter but when she comes back she will come back with that money and gold she went into the kitchen consumed poison and she died a few years after that my auntie that is my mother's younger sister she who was barren for 10 long years was going through her own confusion and it was medically diagnosed that she had a tumor in the uterus and when the tumor was removed a few months after that my uncle he said listen i will marry again because we need to have children for which my auntie gladly agreed but the girl who was proposed or the family they said we cannot give our daughter to you as long as your wife is still there because there will be confusion so as he listened to that my uncle said please can you go back home to which my auntie in deep tears said i have done nothing wrong why should i go i will live as a servant but i will live here there was a conflict and my auntie she poured kerosene on herself and she burnt herself a few years after that in 1978 that was when 
all this confusion was happening and I was trying to understand why these things are happening. And as a devout Hindu, I went to every temple that I could go to. I did every pilgrimage. I went to Dharmasthalam, I went to Tirupati. I did everything that I could. I even worshipped the god of evil, Shani Mahatma. Nothing could give me relief. I went to these religious discourses. I went to the Arya Samaj. I went to the Brahma Samaj, trying to do what I can to make peace with God. But nothing helped me. But then in August 1978, my sister, younger sister, was diagnosed to be having cancer. And the doctor said, listen, she's not going to be living for long. I said, I'm a shameless creature. Every one of my family members are dying and I'm living. So I wanted to run away from my family, which I did, and die in an unknown place. But every time I wanted to take that decision to die, one question bothered me. And that question was, I've seen enough misery and sadness in this life. If I die, I will go to another life. Because as Hindus, we know that there is another life. I do not know if that will be better or that will be worse. I did not have a definite answer. The Bhagavad Gita did not give me a solid conviction. All that it said is if your good works outweighed your bad works, you will have a better life. I had no way of determining which was right. And then as I had gone on, and it was more than three months outside the home, one day I came back to collect my physics book, which was at home, because that was the exam time. And as I came, I discovered that my sister, who had cancer, had died three days ago, and that was the third day ceremony. All my relatives were scolding and they were accusing me, what kind of a son you are, what a responsible, irresponsible person you are. Nobody understood the kind of turmoil that I myself was going through. I said, listen, I'm going to listen to this for some time, but of course, because of the death in the family, every other day there is some function or the other. I said, let it go on, I'll wait for the third month ceremony to be over and I myself will finally put an end to all this. And then I decided that I will do it the way my father did. So I collected the rope. In fact, I got to that same place, the hook where my father himself had tied the knot. And as I tied it, the cupboard just diagonally opposite was open. And there, there was this book staring at me. And that was the Gideon's New Testament. And this book, you know, as it was staring, the only reason why I was keeping that was because it was given to me in the school and it had a golden gilding. I did not want to read it because that was for Christians. But here as the book was staring at me, I said, listen, in another few minutes I'm going to die. Yes, this book is for Christians. If I read it and die, I probably will get some message. But if I don't read it and die, you know, I probably will lose a valuable truth. So I said, I'll go, but I did not want to read from the beginning because time was short. I had put a time for my death. And then I said, let me go to the story of Jesus. Having studied in a Christian school, I know that the Lord Jesus is a good person. I don't know about Christians, but definitely God <laughs> is good. So this was my understanding. So I said, let me read the introduction and get straight to the story of Jesus. Unfortunately, there was no introduction in that New Testament. But God in his mercy led me to do two distinctive sections. And I want to uh, appeal to the Gideons to bring those two distinctive sections back. One section was where to find help when. When you're in trouble when, and there were uh, sections. There's one other section which is not there in the recent edition. And that is what the Bible talks about Christian virtues. It was that section that really meant a lot to me. There was this thing on joy, there was happiness, and there was peace. My name Anand in Sanskrit is the ultimate form of joy. There is no English equivalent word. So I said, let me see the word on peace. There was a page number given, and there was a verse that was uh, given, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And as I went back and forth, I found out that it was the Lord Jesus who had said this. And I said, wow, not bad. Here is this person who has got the power and the audacity to say, my peace I give to you. And he's also got the confidence to say, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
Now I knew, he also said, I do not give the peace that the world gives. I know what peace the world gives. You know, I go and tease somebody or I go and make some mischief in the class, I get some peace. But that peace is only temporary. Or I watch a movie or listen to some music, that is some peace. But that peace is only temporary. The Lord Jesus was saying his peace he is giving. And because of this 1427 or the colon, I figured out the, all the other tract scriptures that I had read in school or what was told. The first verse that came to me was John Romans chapter 3 verse 23, which is okay, all are sinners, you know, I mean, we have come short of the glory of God. But three chapters later, Romans chapter 3 verse 23, I'm still reading in this Gideon's New Testament, which was so powerful. And for a Hindu, it comes as a sharp contrast. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, never will I get anything free from God. Because if I have to get something, I have to promise something. My sister, I remember the cancer started in the leg. We said we will give a silver leg equivalent to what her leg was in offering to Tirupati if she got healed. She did not get healed. So here is this God who is saying he'll give the free gift. And that is salvation. And then I, the one turning point that came was one chapter earlier, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. I mean, I could never understand because as a Hindu, I could never approach a holy God as I am. I had to go through 40 days of penance. I had to purify myself, take a bath here, shave off my head and do whatever I can to come before a holy God. And none of those actions ever purified me, externally, possibly. But here is a God who loved me so much that even while I was still a sinner, he demonstrated himself his love for me in sending his son, Christ Jesus. And as I read that, I said, if ever there was a God, I would like to believe this God. I went on and then went to this other chapter in John, chapter 10, verse 10, all in the Gideon's New Testament. The thief has come to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have life in all its fullness. I know what kind of life I had. That was not life, that was mere existence. But here is the Lord Jesus speaking to living people. See, he's saying, I've come that you may have life. You're already having life, but life in all its fullness. I was convinced that this is the way to go. So I postponed my decision and then I came to the end of the book. And there, there was this prayer, your decision to accept Christ Jesus as a savior. There was a grammatical problem there, which did not allow me to pray because it was the only savior. As a Hindu, we have 33 crores of gods. I said, no way one God can solve all my problem. And I did not pray that prayer, but I prayed another prayer. A prayer went on something like this. Dear God, you are a Christian God, and I am a Hindu. I want to know more about you. For some strange reason, I did not feel I had prayed, because I knew how prayers were in school. So I re-prayed that prayer, including a lot of thou and thee and everything, and I made sure that I ended in Amen. I do not know if God answered the second prayer or the first prayer, but that evening as we were doing combined study, when I went back to meet another colleague of mine, he asked, how is your statics and dynamics going? I mean, I was studying physics, he was supposed to study electricity and magnetism, and I was supposed to study statics and dynamics, and I had not studied. So he said, what have you done? Oh, well, don't worry, I don't have to do that because I've got full of life all my life. He came and kicked me, he said, Anand, you cheated. I did my work, you did not do. But pretty soon he realized that there was something more. And the first thing he said, you said something that is from the Bible. I said, yes, I read the Bible today morning. And he asked me, would you like to know more about Jesus? I said, wait a minute, how did, I mean, he wasn't there when I prayed. I mean, how did he get to know? I said, yes, most certainly. And then he brought an electronics professor from the college and he shared. And the way he shared his testimony was wonderful. Dr. Graham French, who is now in Australia, he said, listen, I realized that at the age of 21, I myself was a sinner, and then I committed myself, my life to God, I accepted Christ Jesus and became a Christian. That entire statement was a loaded statement, a lot of contradiction. The first one was, to my opinion, he was a scientist. How did the scientist realize that he was a sinner? And then he explained Romans chapter three, verse 23, in a beautiful light. He said, in the eyes of my colleagues, I was a good student. In the eyes of my family, I was a good son. But in the eyes of a holy God, I am a sinner. The standards are far higher. 
and then he also said yes i was born in a christian family not everybody who is born in a christian family is a christian it's like saying everybody who is born in a garage is a car <laughs> you have to accept the lord jesus christ then i asked him what happened when you accepted the lord jesus christ he gave second corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 verse 17 and 18 he said therefore if anyone be in christ he is a new creation the old has passed away behold the new has come i caught hold of his hand and i said listen i want to become this new creation just take me what should i do he said you can pray and you will be a new creation i prayed then afterwards i expected something new to be happening i said nothing happened he said no it's a process that begins i immediately looked at his eye and he said you have cheated you said i will become a new person I am not a new person. He said, no, 20 years or 23 years ago, I myself took that decision, but the process of newness has started. And they shared a beautiful verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. All we with unveiled faces, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As Dr. Graham shared, that day, something new happened something new happened the following day i still am struggling with sin but when i see him i know that i will be perfect this has led me on to continue in the professional life and i'm so convinced of the word of god that i use it even in my secular work in fact whenever i have an official meeting i share a verse whenever i conduct a leadership training in the office i share a verse several people in the office have got offended once and this happened exactly last year march somebody who got offended wrote a email an anonymous email to the managing director and the president and said listen anand pillai is propagating christianity in his official position in the office since it was an anonymous anonymous email it was not attended to but there was a word sent to another senior vice president say listen ask anand to be a little bit careful that word came to me but the second one was even more accusatory there was another mail two days later somebody again an anonymous mail it was basically google123 at yahoo.com and the person just wrote that mail and this person posed himself as a muslim and he said anand degrades us he is projecting christianity to be a superior religion in fact in the subject of that mail it was said hcl it services or anand pillai's christianity services that was the subject of the mail and in that mail it was said that i quote the bible and i mentioned that you know jesus christ is a great lord and everything and this time because it was even more direct and this particular mail was marked to 40 other people senior people at the general manager and vice president level that mail was forwarded to me with no comments my president and managing director he just sent it to me i looked at that and i was very disturbed and for some strange reason i did not even share it with my wife because i know what she will do she said you are too aggressive just you know calm down because there was one time when I came out with a very aggressive tract, you know, for executives. We have, you know, the shirt pocket. So here is this tract which is sticking out and everybody in the church, they said, you know, put some catchy title, how to have peace and how to have, uh, you know, a solution with God or how to get back to God. But I came out with a tract which said, how to go to hell. <laughs> and then when you open the tract, it basically says, proceed as you are, you will land up there. And then when you close, how not to go that path and come. So I'm known to be aggressive. So I did not share my, with my wife because she'll say, calm down. I was going through my own turmoil, but as I prayed that Saturday and Sunday, Monday early morning, I got enough courage to write a reply to the mail. And as I wrote the mail, I copied it to all the 40 people. And this is how I ended it. I said, everything that this person has said is true. Yes, I do use the Bible. Yes, I do quote the scriptures and I gave all the scriptures that I was quoting. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10. When the axe is blunt and its edge unsharpened, more effort is needed, but skill will bring success. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 3. You know, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Romans, uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you are working for the Lord, not for men. And then I went on quoting all the other scriptures and then I ended with this particular paragraph. I said, I'm a Hindu. I have this as my personal choice. I have taken a choice to read and to worship the God of the Bible. 
this is something that i will do and i will continue to do god is no man's debtor he will continue to do what he has to do and today just recently i was promoted to be the brand ambassador for the company's key identity god is no man's debtor thank you gideons brother, brother. please wait brother you have received a bible which transformed your life and that bible would have become old you very old very old very